25 years ago tonight, actor David Strickland, most famous for his role in the sitcom Suddenly Susan, appeared on Later, then hosted by Suddenly Susan cast member Judd Nelson. So it was a very good interview for that era of Later, which is not saying much. These people, none of them, were Bob Costas. But this episode is pretty darn good. Strickland uh, sadly would leave the cast of Suddenly Susan and this mortal coil with his suicide after a big cocaine binge and hanging out with Andy Dick. Coincidentally, Bryn Hartman, who took her own life after taking her husband Phil Hartman's life, was hanging out with Andy Dick right before she did what she did. Don't be a dick. Don't hang out with Andy Dick. I bet you that's why we don't see him around anymore. Everyone knows don't hang out with Andy Dick. Nelson would leave the series because he couldn't go on after Strickland's departure. So the this this is probably the best late era later in my collection. Again, from 25 years ago tonight, September 23rd, 1997. Welcome to Later. I'm Judd Nelson. As you may know, I'm on the NBC show Suddenly Susan. And everybody thinks that it's Brooks' show. But it wasn't always that way. In fact, when we shot the pilot, it had a totally different name. Yeah, yeah you know, I know. It just sounds better, doesn't it? But then there was this other show I got bumped from. Uh, maybe you've heard of it. Yeah, that's right. I was this close to being the biggest, most popular guy in the world. But that's nothing compared to what happened after Johnny retired. Check this out. From the NBC studios in Fairbanks, the Tonight Show with Judd Nelson. And Judd Nelson. I thought I had that job locked, but uh, what the heck, anyone can host an 11.30 show. But hosting a show at 1.30 in the morning every five years is a much bigger challenge. <laughs> Now, you've seen my guest tonight in shows like Roseanne, Sister, Sister, and Mad About You. He currently plays the Generation X music critic on Suddenly Susan, and I play his boss. Here's a clip. Hey, Suze. What are you doing here, Todd? Nothing. Just uh, picking up the new issue of Saltwater Sports Fisherman. <laughs> nice ears. <laughs> All right, look, if you must know, I'm doing an article on this whole Trekkie obsession. Todd! Todd, he's here! Bones is here! Yes. <laughs> Be right there. Please welcome David Strickland. So, welcome. Thank you. Haven't seen you in a while. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, in a, in a weird kind of twist of fate, I understand that you met Brooke Shields many years ago, something about a Princeton football game? I did. I was like uh, seven or eight years old. She was a, I don't know, freshman or sophomore in college. And uh, 
I had never seen any of her movies or even really knew who she was, and a bunch of my friends had said, oh, that's Brooke Shields over there, and, and she was attractive and huge, so I thought she was somebody. And uh, they said, why don't you go sit next to her? And I said, sure, I'll go sit next to her. And she was sitting there, you know, with her hair, watching football. And so I went, I was like seven, and I went just and sat next to her, just like a total pervert, and just... <laughs> and then I told her the story, like, you know, when we met, and she just thought, oh, that's you. <laughs> she, like, remembered that I was... You remember? That was like a seven-year-old pervert. Well, I also understand that you had a very memorable audition for Suddenly Susan. Well, I went in and uh, Brooke was there to like meet all the actors and she was, I guess, late. And so I just got, kept getting more and more nervous. So I go in and in between when I'd gone in, a kid had thrown up next door at another audition, like some, <laughs> some seven or eight year old kid. So I thought, well, that's a good story to go in and tell that this young kid had thrown up in the office. So I go into the audition and I, hey, how you doing? Nothing. Good. Anyway, um, so this kid threw up next door and, 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 you know, he was nervous and he threw up. Nothing. So, and then I say, well, in a footnote, he got the job. Nothing. And so then, you know, I'm just sitting there, okay, okay. And they're like, are you ready to start? And, and, and I said, I think I'm going to throw up. Because, <laughs> I mean, they, they, literally, it's a comedy. And these people didn't laugh. They didn't say anything. And Brooke just, you know, sat there again. Huge. <laughs> so. Well, you got the job. But I got the job, yeah. Now listen, on the show, you play a uh, Gen X music critic. Now, do you feel any kind of responsibility to represent the entire Generation X? Uh, I hope not as my character. Um, <laughs> I don't know. It's, I, I heard something that, that, like, generations before had sex, drugs, and rock and roll, and, and, and we have masturbation, crack, and Hanson. <laughs> so, so if I represent that generation... <laughs> Hanson, uh, that's that all-girls band, right? It's, yeah. <laughs> yeah, now, um, you play a character that is celibate for a while on the show. Yeah. Now, was that uh, tough to play? Um, well, I never quite understood why he was celibate. Uh, I think they wanted to just have it, him sort of explode, you know, uh, by having sex on it. But it lasted... Metaphorically. Like a, a metaphor, yeah. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but it lasted, like, a week. I was celibate for a week, and then the next episode, I, I think it was something, a little snafu there. They thought it was going to be something funny. And it, you had an affair with someone else on the show? I actually, yeah, I had sex with, uh, well, first I had sex with a girl when I saved her life at, the, uh, at some concert or something. I Heimlicked her. Um, <laughs> before we had sex. <laughs> okay, of course. And then... Uh, <laughs> and then, uh, and then I, had se I had sex with Kathy Griffin on the show. Um, um. And, she I'm with me. <laughs> yeah, I bet. Okay. Now, um, um, you play the mu uh, music critic on the show, but do you have any kind of musical background? Because I know that a lot of times backstage you had your little pig nose amp yeah. and you were playing the guitar. I did play the guitar when I was little. And, in fact, uh, I was in a band with uh, Bobby Sheehan, who is now the bass player for the Blues Traveler. And I always used to tell him that he was terrible and that he should take some lessons. And, uh, he, we, you know, we almost threw him out of the band. And, uh, uh, you know, now I'm looking a little bit like a loser after making that comment. But... Uh, <laughs> I do, I do enjoy music and do, do like playing music, but, but I'm not very good. So. Well, you sound good in the room next to mine. Yeah, well, thank you. Listen, uh, we'll be back in a minute. Uh, back here on Later, I'm Judd Nelson with my guest, David Strickler. You didn't touch her. No. What'd I tell you? Okay, and, and he was trying to catch her because... Uh, did you see the tortured look on his face? Don't you realize what that means? Okay. Do you see the tortured look on my face? <laughs> Does it look like I know what that means? He's in love with her, you idiot. Oh, that. Oh, well, yeah, I know that. Now? Well, here's to us. Here's to a great filmmaker. Oh. And, and here's to... Mm-hmm. Um... Mm-hmm. Here's to you. Uh. Oh, God. All right, all right. I love you, man. Welcome back to Later. I'm Judd Nelson here with David Strickland. Now, that's a clip of uh, you from Mad About You. Right. You had a recurring role as Paul's backstabbing friend. 
Now, do you think that you would have done more episodes if you were a nice character as opposed to the well, not nice character? Uh, actually, it was originally, I didn't have any lines the first episode. I just, it was such a great show, I decided to work on the show doing nothing. And all I had was a laugh. And it was just, how he was supposed to suggest something, and I was just supposed to go, <laughs> but I didn't stop at that. I went, <laughs> and I just kept laughing the whole time. I got a call next week, he said, he really liked the way you laugh. Will you come back, and we'll, we'll write you some lines. And then from that, I did seven episodes, just from having no lines and laughing. So, then he wrote me off, though. Well, um, you also uh, worked on The Roseanne Show. Now, um, uh, uh, or, uh, uh, how was, uh, well, was she to work with? That was trying. Um, it, was, it was a good experience. I actually, though, had to work with her second husband. Husband. It was his uh, acting debut. Ben? Big Ben. Um, ben may want to look at other options as far as career. Um, but I had to arrest her for, for exposing her breasts in public. And she... Um, Both of them? Well, one was... <laughs> one was enough? One broke the, one broke the law. She, she said to me, uh, in the second take, I'm going to do something a little different. Because really, you can't really show the boobs. And uh, I said, okay. And uh, she showed me the, boob, the tattoo and the boobs and everything in the second take. I get, yeah, I guess my reaction wasn't, wasn't good enough. But she got a hell of a reaction on the uh, second take. So uh, she was, she's brilliant. She's, it was great to work with her, but, but it was a trying week. And that's it. <laughs> Okay, now you've done tons of pilots. Yeah. I mean, you've Pilot done King. many, many, many pilots that uh, unfortunately didn't see the light of day. Right. Um, now, now that you're working on Suddenly Susan and it's on the air and it is a successful show, um, uh, how is <laughs> yeah, how is how, how is, has your life changed? Um, well, I think I think you're forced to sort of. Uh, uh, grow up a little bit. I think when, when, when I was doing all these pilots and stuff, I still uh, I felt very uh, not having any direction, and this has sort of forced me to uh, be a little bit more responsible. It's nice to have a steady gig, but at the same point, it's, it's just you realize it could, it could end, and so uh, not to bring the whole show down, but uh, uh, it, it's, it's done a lot that way as far as just making me, you know, But I mean, did you aware. ever get discouraged when things weren't working out, and if so, what made you keep trying to... I, I really don't know. I think about that a lot. I definitely get discouraged a lot. I still get discouraged sometimes. I think it's just striving for perfection. You're never going to quite maybe be satisfied, which is a good trade, and at the same time, it can also be something that's bad. But uh, I would just... I would Usually, I would look at the jobs where I was working, and I would just want to get out of them so badly that it just... I would, I would figure failing at acting was better than working as a valet parking attendant, which was <laughs> what I was doing. So it was, you know... Not that being a valet parking no, no, no. is in any way <laughs> Not at all, a bad but... thing to do or to strive to do. No, but for the rest of my life. <laughs> for the, for, the, for Man, the rest of my life. The show's on at 1.30 in the morning. Who's watching it? The guy's going to get home from work. Right? <laughs> but, uh... <laughs> I, definitely, I definitely wanted to do something other than that for the rest of my life because, you know... I mean, the perks were great, don't get me wrong. <laughs> I'm never getting my car parked again, right? Yeah, I'm never getting my car parked again. I wonder when I come back, the steering wheel's going, hey, what the... <laughs> well, listen, um, I understand that you just completed filming uh, a new film called Deliverance. Wasn't that uh, already it's made? It's called, it's called Delivered. Uh, it's, yeah. it's the prequel. <laughs> the prequel to, uh, to Deliverance. I play, uh, I play a young Ned Beatty in what... <laughs> What was he like growing up? <laughs> yeah. to it's a lot of me and farm animals and just kind of experimentation and how he became... <laughs> yes, thank you. Now, I understand that it's a, um, a story about a mass murderer and a pizza delivery guy. Right, I play this, uh, this pizza delivery guy who's, who drops out of college. He's very bright, disgruntled with the way his life's going and has problems with everybody in his life. And I deliver a pizza to a guy who's very similar uh, to me, except he's taken his aggression a little further and he's become violent. And I deliver a pizza to him in the act of him killing someone. And uh, he thinks I know who he is. I don't. And he starts to uh, follow me and he gets a hold of my tape recorder. I'm always venting in this tape recorder. And he starts killing the people on the tape recorder. And I get set up to be blamed. It's funny. It's scary. It's uh, Ron Eldar plays the, uh, the killer who's very good. Oh, and, yeah. Uh, now, did, did you feel any kind of different responsibility because you're a lead character in a film now? Is there any uh, um, kind of pressure you I feel? I didn't, because I'd never done a whole lot of films anyway, uh, you know, this way. So I, yeah. I didn't really feel, looking back, it was sort of frightening. You, know, you always wonder if it's going to make sense, if it's going to work out. I had to lose a lot of weight for the role, so uh, I was sort of beside myself anyway. I never really knew. 
what I was doing. And we shot all nights, three, three in the afternoon to five in the morning for 30 nights. In Seattle. In Seattle. What was that like? Uh, I never saw much of Seattle, really. I slept all day, so I couldn't tell you where anything was. Um, <laughs> rained a lot, and uh, there were a lot of bridges. Uh, a lot of darkness. <laughs> well, that sounds good. Now, I've always thought that doing a sitcom is very much a hybrid of film and theater. It's like theater in the yeah. fact that you have a live audience like here, so you can tell when something's going well. And it's like film in the sense that if you do something wrong, you can go back and do it again. In your experience working on film, what do you find is uh, more difficult or taxing, doing a film or, or doing a, a sitcom? I would say the hours, at least with our film, the crew worked so hard that, that everybody got really, really tired. I think with sitcom, you know you're going home at 5 o'clock or 6 o'clock. You know you're going to move on to something next next week. With a film, uh, if, a, if a little something goes wrong, it can really affect the whole shoot. And, and I haven't done a big studio film, but I'm assuming that the bigness of it is, would be the downside. I feel like we're a real family with the crew, the cast, and everything. Yeah. And that's really nice to know every day it's going to be the same group of people. You're going to be there for, hopefully, a long time. Um, yeah. But that's, that'd be say, the big difference, the, the hours. And OK, well, we'll be back in a minute with my guest, David Strickland, here on the This is later, and I'm Judd Nelson here with David Strickland. Now, I understand that you moved out to California from New Jersey when you were in high school. Right. And what was that like? That, that was fun. The culture shock when uh, you were in high school, too. A little bit of culture shock. My, my, my dad rented us surfing movies and Fast Times at Ridgemont High. I came from Princeton, New Jersey. Um, oh, yeah. Thanks, Bill. Uh, <laughs> so they got Princeton. Uh, it was weird because my high school was a mile, I went to Palisades High School, it was a mile from the, uh, from the ocean, and everything was outdoor. The lunchroom was outdoor, and I had come from a boarding school in the east where Everything's inside because of the winter and everything. So it was a culture shock, and you know, there were Corvettes in the parking lot and all those stereotypical things. So it was a, it was a bit, and I had this hairdo. Uh, a lot of people in the East, at least, not, there you go again with the valet parking problem. A lot of, I had a bad haircut living in the East there. It was parted in the middle and like this, and I always did this a lot, and I had this habit. So when I first got there, I wasn't really um, popular. Not, no, no, I had to change my hairstyle, and this still doesn't go over well anywhere, so. Well, when did you start um, acting? Were you acting in high school? I mean, how did you begin? Um, well, I, I wasn't going to graduate from high school because the systems, the, the prep school and, and the public school, the credit system was different. So I was five credits short, so I was forced to take this acting class. That was the one thing I hadn't, hadn't taken. And I just went in and tried to horse around as much as possible. And at the end, the lady came up to me and said, you know, you may want to try to pursue this. Maybe you can make some money at this. And I thought, OK, that's great. That's the only career guidance I've ever gotten. Um, <laughs> and. Uh, you know, I decided that that would be a good idea, and then for the next six years, didn't make a dime. So, uh, so that was good. But uh, I hope so. That you didn't you. go to college, uh, even though well, you're from I, a family I, that's. Very, I went uh, to most of the junior colleges offered in Southern California for a couple weeks. <laughs> I never really found one I liked, so I went to. You know, I don't really care for the teachers here, so I just tried a bunch of different ones. Now, is it true that you've done something like 65 student films? I mean, were you looking for a free meal? Uh, <laughs> yeah, actually, yeah. actually, I was. Well, I, I kept thinking that the next one, you know, somebody, somebody would come down to the screening and somebody would say, hey, this, this guy, you know, maybe we could do something. But I did this one, uh, and I was very excited about getting it, which was an eight-day shoot, non-sync, which means it's not really music or anything, non-dialogue, so there's no talking. And it was, my hands were featured, really. It was just, it was a lot of this, and, and I guess it was like to, it was... Just a, eight days with just your hands? Eight days. Of, Were there any other of your body parts involved with those hands? Little, a little wrist. Okay. A little wrist. But it, it, it was a little... It was a lot of this, and, 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 you know, it was just some... I don't know what the hell it was, but, but I, I remember really thinking, someone's going to see this and say, who, that, like, this could make me. Who's the guy with the hands? So what did you do, like, uh, to support yourself while you were doing... 60 student films? Um, well, I had, uh, I had some interesting, interesting jobs, a lot of telemarketing jobs. Uh, I had this one in particular where I, I, uh, I, got, I called and he said, hey, it's no hard sell, no appointment setting, you just, you're selling some stuff over the phone. And I thought, great, it was like 6 in the morning till 9, uh, 9, it was 6 to 9, 3 hours, so I could go to the bevy of auditions I didn't have. Uh, <laughs> and so I get there and it's like down 10 flights of stairs and it's sort of dark and creepy and I go in and there's just adult video cassettes everywhere. And these guys are on the phone selling adult 
video cassettes to like the East Coast and video stores. And I mean, I, I don't, you know, the, no, no, the acting is superior. I'm telling you, it's really good. Ron Jeremy does this thing. And, no, he's really, no, you gotta see it. And they're all doing this, and I'm like, just trapped. And the idea was that you could be a millionaire in a fortnight. You know, you can sell hundreds and thousands of these videos. And I remember saying, um, I tried to think of excuses to get out of there. There's no way I'm doing this. And there's, these guys are shouting in the background, uh, you know, these obscenities about how great these films are. And I said, I I've got to move my car. You know, and, and I was you just bailed? No, and, I, and the guy says, where? You, you're parked in the uh, parking lot. It's, it's good all day. And I thought, oh, I parked in the meter. There's no, he's like, where? Because we we're like an industrial thing. And I was just... <laughs> I'm wetting my pants. Just let me go. Let me go. So I didn't, I didn't actually end up working there, but I had a lot of those types of experiences. Well, man, well, uh, yeah. we'll be back in about a minute. Uh, we're here on later with my guest, David Strippen. <laughs> Welcome back to Later. I'm Judd Nelson here with David Strippen. Now, uh, do you remember when... You, Nestor, and I went to Las Vegas for the weekend, and we were supposed to take a flight back, and right. we had a little problem yeah. making that flight. Would you like to tell us about that? Um, well, that, I think you're referring to the time I uh, didn't uh, come through with your travel plans. I had gone to bed <laughs> because I, I don't really care much for Sin City. Uh, I just put down the Bible and was dozing off. <laughs> I think you were in the casinos doing who knows what. Uh, but I had forgotten to make the travel reservations. It was the weekend of the Tyson fight, so the next morning I wake up and said, yeah, we need to get back to L.A. We had a show, or Judd had a show to do. Uh, Is that the show you're also on? Right, the show that I sometimes okay. am on. Yeah. So I called the travel agent or uh, the airlines. Every flight is booked. We could fly to, like, Portugal and then, you know, via something else and be back next Thursday. So I had to go, I had to go tell Judd that, that, you know, we didn't get a flight, and this went over, and he, you know, immediately starts throwing a tantrum. Well, you know, I have a show to do, and... Uh, 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 uh. Um, so Judd says he's going to rent a car. And uh, if you've never driven with Judd, we can make it, you know, a five-hour trip would be, what, about an hour? So they forced me to sit in the back seat. They're not giving me any snacks. Everything. They're eating pretzels. No, you had to eat. Oh, no, the guy, he had to eat like every 30 miles. He was having a hypoglycemic attack. I was starving. Well, yeah, and they're eating, they're eating Tostitos and dip, and I'm in the front. So then I take a little nap, you know, I'm in the back because I'm starving. I take a little nap, and I look up, and I think we're parked because I can't see the speedometer because it's at 130. We're in a Nissan Maxima doing 130, and, you know, and there's Judd with his hair. <laughs> That was the trip. Thank you. I kind of remember that story differently, but yeah. that was great. Thank you very much. That is our show for tonight, and special thanks to my guest, David Strickland. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you very much. I'm Doug Nelson, and I'll catch you later. Thanks a lot, man. Thanks for watching Cleveland Live Music. It's awfully bright out here. I'd click on another one of my videos. Quit looking into the sun. Your mother told you not to do that. Please hit the subscribe button. And if you want to support the channel more, there's GoFundMe and Patreon information in the video descriptions. Ooh, ooh!